Yeah, hello everyone. Um, so I have the privilege of speaking after Frederick's very uh, comprehensive and, and elegant presentation of the uh, legal landscape of AI. So what I'll try to do in my presentation is uh, to try to narrow it down. You know, AI, medical AI is a very broad field, so I'll try to narrow it down to one specific case of application, which is AI in clinical neuroscience, especially neurology and neuropsychiatry, especially through um, neural interfaces, uh, or otherwise called brain-machine interfaces. So here's an interesting field of uh, uh, AI application. Um, some of you who are working in neurology might recall that it's not the first time that we're talking about uh, the application of uh, some kind of automated processing to uh, neural data. A uh, few decades ago, um, people in neuroscience were very excited about the potential of neuroimaging technologies, especially fMRI. Um, and for example, here I'm quoting John Dylan Ains, a very prominent computational neuroscientist, who thought about over a decade ago that fMRI could help us uh, decode very detailed contents of a person's thoughts, including visual percepts, ideas, memories, intentions, emotions, and so on. Um, so we were very excited in the neuro community, but then uh, some party pooper came along and uh, made us realize that there were some problems with this. In particular, um, what uh, fMRI could help us do was not to uh, decode the, the content of mental state, but just the uh, representation that encode those contents, uh, but also, um as you might know, there was a big replicability crisis in, in uh, clinical neuroscience, especially fMRI studies, due to a low sample size, other statistical problems, and uh, interpersonal variability. But now AI is kind of to make this uh, uh, debate in vogue again, uh, in particular the debate about so-called brain reading or mind reading. And this is probably due to two main things. One is the ubiquity of data about the human brain and more generally about the human nervous system. And the second is the increasing computational uh, capabilities of AI models, especially deep learning models for decoding those data. And the technological family that is the most relevant here is that of uh, neural interfaces, which can be very broadly defined as, as it was done in this Royal Society report, as electronic devices that are placed on the outside or inside of the brain or other components of the central nervous system to do basically two things, either to record activity from the brain or to stimulate the brain, so to write into the brain, or both in the so-called bimodal or bidirectional neural interfaces. Um, and the ubiquity that I was referring to is mainly due to the fact that uh, the technologies that are capable of doing this do not necessarily need any more voluminous uh, medical equipment, but can also be uh, implemented in some circumstances through wearable uh, devices. And we are also seeing a blurry line between medical and semi-medical or no medical applications. Um, these are all consumer grade uh, neural interfaces that can be used for a variety of health related purposes, such as reducing uh, anxiety and agitation symptoms, improving mental relaxation, uh, as well as improving sleep hygiene. Um, and some companies like Apple are working towards integrating some kind of uh, uh, brain reading capabilities, in this case in the form of EEG, electroencephalography, in everyday wearable technologies such as their AirPods. So the first ethical problem that arises here um, is uh, that with some colleagues we have found out that a lot of these technologies I'm referring to use unprotected data sharing channels. Um, they can collect context-rich information in particular because this can be combined with contextual uh, data uh, and this can be used to draw privacy sensitive inferences even from uh, known uh, sensitive data and uh, uh, in the case of consumer grade applications this is happening in the absence of institutional oversight uh, by ethics committees or professional supervision by physicians and there's also a problem of limited traceability of the inferences that these technologies make for two reasons. One is that uh, software use in this domain is mainly proprietary software. The second reason is the opacity of the AI algorithms that are used for the coding. Um, with regard to AI, AI is really allowing us to do a new thing in neuroscience, and here I 
you know, I usually like to tone down what AI can do, but I think the methodological revolution that AI is bringing to clinical neuroscience cannot be underestimated. Um, for many years, what we could do in neuroscience is the so-called forward inference, which means uh, manipulating a specific psychological function to identify localized effects in the brain. Um, for example, you know, if I uh, want to know what brain regions are engaged in arithmetic calculus, I let my participants do some arithmetic calculus while their brain activity has been uh, monitored, for example, using fMRI, and then I can infer which brain regions are engaged in arithmetic calculus. But again, this is far away from reading the content of mental states. Uh, but with AI, we can increasingly do so. Um, Jack Gallant at Berkeley has been pioneering this new approach to uh, neural decoding called reverse inference, which is basically reasoning backwards from the raw uh, data sets, such as data sets of neuronal activation, to infer the engagement of specific mental processes. And what they did, they presented participants with some visual stimuli, in this case a video clip, uh, it's just a movie, and then they train an artificial neural network to reconstruct the visual and semantic content of that video clip just from the raw data set of, uh, of, neural, uh, of neural activation. So the algorithm, the AI model, has no access to the initial video clip whatsoever, uh, but is simply capable of reconstructing what people are looking at uh, by having access to the uh, neuronal data set alone, and this is the level of sophistication that they were able to achieve. Uh, this is about eight years ago. Uh, as you can see, it's uh, not sufficiently uh, sophisticated to infer who is the person being represented in the video clip, but it's sufficiently uh, sophisticated to tell that uh, the people are looking at a person as opposed to an object or a non-human animal. Uh, and with regard to semantic information, uh, they created semantic branches uh, that are color-coded for the degree of significance of predicting the next word uh, based on this model. So this uh, happened to be a very useful model to decode uh, mental states from uh, neural decoding. Uh, now, eight years ago, we have uh, much more powerful models. For example, Nishimoto in Osaka has been using uh, stable diffusion, which is a type of uh, latent diffusion, uh, to basically uh, expand this experimental model. And as you can see, the level of sophistication of the uh, decoding and the image reconstruction has been increasing significantly. So this studies, and there are many more, so Alex South, for example, in Texas is using LLMs. This is in the GPT paradigm for neural decoding. Um, so there are many different um, AI models that can be used for neural decoding. Many of them seem to be very useful, and this is the reason why Nature this year published not one, not two, but actually three editorials on the topic of brain reading and its um, new big comeback. So this is uh, all interesting, but you may wonder, how does this all apply to the clinical domain? And here we go. So this is uh, work uh, done at, in San Francisco by Ed Chang and his group. Uh, and they were capable of using this neural decoding technology in order to power a neural prosthetics uh, device for speech synthesis uh, that would allow a patient with quadriplegia um, and aphasia so it's an ALS patient, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis patient with, in the advanced stage that is no longer capable, capable of interacting with the world verbally. Uh, and they uh, design a speech decoder that is based on neural decoding uh, that is capable of produce, producing 78, so decoding 78 words per minute. Uh, and here is a brief yeah. demo. It is good to see you giving them the ability to communicate again with their loved ones and caregivers is really what we're looking to do. I was thinking about running to the store. What time will you be home? In about an hour. Do not make me laugh. <laughs> That's the first time we've ever had a conversation using this. System. So this is the very 
uh, one of the very first approaches, a very successful one, to allow a person that has completely lost the ability to talk, to speak again using a neural interface. But this also brings us uh, uh, towards an uh, ethical dilemma, because on the, one, on the one end, we want to uh, collect more data and process them in order to enable technologies of this kind. But on the other hand, and I mentioned Apple before, uh, neural data are a very interesting asset for the data economy, because they can be used to make inferences about people's intention, preferences, and emotions. Uh, and this is highlighted by the ethical significance of the human brain, which is not like an organ like any other, uh, but it's the fundamental coordinating center of life maintaining processes and the enabler of mental faculties. So how do we go from here? Um, well, with uh, some colleagues, we have been working on developing an ethical model that is called mental privacy which is really designed to uh, enhance people's freedom and capacity to conceal their mental information and prevent uh, non-consenting intrusion uh, into their neurocognitive domain. Uh, and this is really a privacy approach that is tailored to some unique features of brain data. Uh, because brain data share some interesting features with many different data, uh, but they also have unique ones. Uh, they are, in particular, they are data with propositional and semantic value. Um, so they bring meaning, uh, such as, uh, and this is what they have in common with other data like written text, uh, voice recordings, or hand gestures, uh, but they also bring behavioral, so they, they can be collected and uh, processed from people uh, even in the absence of uh, exhibited behavior. And this is what they have in common with, for example, genetic data or blood tests. So the uh, m mental privacy model is a multi-level govern uh, governance model that should operate at many different levels. And in the last part of my presentation, I'll just break a brief summary of what uh, international organizations are doing in this domain. So the uh, first level of uh, governance that I will talk about is responsible innovation by uh, private actors and uh, research communities. And here we have a lot of international organizations like the IEEE standards and the International Brain Initiative that are working on developing standards for neural interfaces, uh, so ethical standards as well as privacy standards that would make these technologies private by design. And I have the privilege of leading the IBI group that is working on this. Uh, and among the many uh, approaches that we're working on, there is a privacy by design uh, approach uh, based on the utilization of privacy preserving technology, but also on the development of tools for selective filtering. So tools that can decompose recorded brain signals into collection of uh, signal components in real time to extract only the information that is needed for the specific clinical task and filtering out everything else uh, in order to make this technology compatible with the purpose specification of the GDPR. At the second level, soft law and ethical guidelines, the OECD has uh, developed the first international ethical guideline in this domain. It's called the Recommendation on Responsible Innovation in Neurotech. Um, and at the third level, data protection regulation, uh, I want to highlight how this all apply to the GDPR. So the GDPR is not applicable if the brain data are anonymized. Uh, and as I mentioned before, brain data may undermine the principle of purpose limitation because it's technically uh, very difficult, if not impossible, to, uh, uh, to focus ex exclusively on the data that are purpose-specific and not on the myriad of brain signals that are to be found. And then um, the GDPR sets a list of sensitive data categories uh, that, are, um, that can protect brain data, but there are exceptions. In particular, it's not comprehensive enough to include uh, emotion, thoughts, and so on, where they are not related to health status, sexualities, or political and religious beliefs. This is something that we've been trying to, uh, a gap that have been trying to uh, bridge uh, with a data protection colleague introducing a, a tool that's called Mental Data Protection Impact Assessment. Uh, I will not go into detail in the interest of time, but I'm happy to talk more about this. And also, I want to highlight that the EU AI Act that was mentioned by Frederic before is actually also bridging this gap uh, because it's making uh, the inference of uh, um, emotional and co cognitive processes uh, sensitive by default regardless 
of the domain of application. Okay, so I want to conclude with the fundamental rights domain, uh, because from an ethical perspective, uh, protecting information in the brain uh, has been uh, observed by many to be a prerequisite of both personal autonomy and freedom of thought, which also happen to be not just ethical desiderata, but fundamental human rights. And this is the reason why the United Nations Human, uh, human Rights Council is also working in this domain. They approved uh, last year a draft resolution, uh, the HRC 51, uh, on uh, neurotechnology and human rights, and uh, the resulting working group will release their uh, findings at the end of this year. So more to come in the field of ethics and governance in this field. I'll stop here, and thanks for your attention. Thank you very much.